Hi, and welcome to another exciting edition of Game Development. My name is Nate Nessler, and this is for Hyperactive Studios. Now, uh, before we left off on uh, Reflection Shaders, but we did uh, the Pixel Shader side of it. And we haven't really looked at the Vertex shaded uh, variation of it. And so I decided to go back and look at the, model, um, the shaders and see what I could do for putting it into Vertex um, as far as that goes. And in doing so, uh, previously where I couldn't pass after I normalized it, hell, it passed it in. And I think it has to do with some updates I had to Microsoft. And after doing so, um, this is eight months later from when I made some of the other videos. And after doing so, things I tried to do previously wouldn't work. Like at one point, there was in Windows 7, I couldn't actually use trigonometry algorithms or sine and cosine and stuff like that it just wouldn't work it, but then I could take it to another computer and the code would work fine so it wasn't a problem with the code but rather um, operating system updates and once I put that in whatever conflict there was in lasts uh, a while here now on Windows 7 and and on um, uh, XP here has gone away uh, most of my problems though was on Windows 7 uh, and that was you know shortly thereafter it came out and uh, my Windows 7 isn't nearly crashing as much as it used to by a long shot. So, you know, this makes uh, this made a major difference. And so I was able to optimize the shaders a lot more than what I could previously, just just due to weirdness happening um, <laughs> for not being able to pass values that should have been able to pass, um, are now passing just fine. So I don't know what was going on, but um, regardless, uh, the values are passing properly now. So. I was able to optimize the shader further. And I kind of want to go over that with you. Um, I really haven't spent any real effort towards optimization. Um, I was asked in order to do uh, excellent commenting or professional commenting in the program so that way it would be easy to read and understand and things wouldn't be confusing. So I showed uh, students how to actually break down comments so that you know your stuff looks professional and it's not just haphazardly thrown in there like I did with some of the other comments previously because you know just throwing it out there to get it done um, but you really do want to comment professionally um, and this is a good example of that so here we got textures in and out parameters so on and so forth and I made it all caps because if you didn't make it all caps it made it harder to read by far and then this likes these different sections here easy to read and I just did in-depth comments and it's fine to comment like this it does not hurt your code it does not make it um, take longer to run the um, shaders it doesn't make it compute longer or anything of the sort Instead, what it does is it just makes it easier to read, makes it easier to find what you're looking for. If I'm flipping through here quickly like this and scrolling through, I can easily find artist controls or something like that. If I'm looking here at the code, I have to actually sit there and read everything to pick up on it. So it just lets me navigate the code faster when I'm editing and trying to fix things myself or someone else picks it up on the team when I'm working with other team members, things of that nature. It just makes life easier and it looks nicer, more professional, and really doesn't take hardly any more time to do it and the results are a lot better. So this is a good example of what you want to do for commenting on stuff just so that you clearly mark different areas and you want to categorize and mark and uh, keep things in their own little respective areas so that way everything's in one space that way you can find things where you need to you're not hunting all over the code to find something you know just be organized keep things clean and keep things nice it makes a huge difference and that really goes a long ways if you don't do that then it starts to become a nightmare in order to maintain uh, the code and it takes you longer to hunt down and find what you're trying to fix so by all means please do this and once you do to a commenting setup like this, then you can just keep reusing it over and over again uh, between your different shaders. You don't have to put in a lot of those comments again. So like I did this whole breakout here, but I mean honestly, once I have this and I just keep I copy and paste my own code back in from one of the shaders and then I write on top of that and make whatever modifications I need to to that shader. And I do that a lot actually. Um, so you know if I wanted to put that in see without it though, it starts getting kind of difficult to see where different sections start and end and all this stuff whereas if I came in here and did something like that well bam there I know that's where the artist controls are 
So, <laughs> you know, it's just, you can start to see the difference here by having that stuff in there. Same thing goes with textures, you know, so on and so forth. So, it just cleans things up to where it's just a lot easier and immediately you start seeing a big difference here in the code. It's just start suddenly becoming a lot easier to find your way around in it and it's a lot better. Now I'm going to prove something to you. We're going to look at some of this optimization stuff here and I want to prove to you that in fact it doesn't hurt you to have uh, these comments in here. Some people might be skeptical of this, um, in which case I'll prove that yeah, it flat does not affect your code and will not hurt you in any way, shape, or form. I just really feel like I need to put the rest of these in there. Sorry, a perfectionist. Um, <laughs> can't help myself. Uh, looks better. Looks a lot better. I like breaking things down through sections like this. This is how I normally code um, with commenting and stuff when I'm working on an actual contract for someone or something of that nature. I um, make sure all my code's very clean and organized and I comment things religiously and uh, it makes a big difference and then you know it's not a headache or a problem and then when I come back to my stuff later on too I don't have a problem. So here we go updated and there we go it's a nice commenting now. Uh, of course it could be better on the comments but yeah, well, goodbye. Alright, but anyways, let's prove in fact that this does do what I just said it does. And um, so I did it on this no texture one, it doesn't matter, I could do it with the roof texture. This one's with texture, I should have said with texture, but I didn't name it that way. So this is a shader, I'm going to get into how I wrote this here in just a second. Uh, but first of all, I want, and this is computes really fast by the way, and I'll show you why that is in just a bit. But I want to see the performance. Now, the shader performance may not just be sitting in front of you like this. If it's not, you need to go to Analyze and then Analyze Shader Performance or Control F8 will give you this. And in doing so, you can actually get a readout here. Let's see if you can't see this in the video of your values and what things are you know requiring. And so you can see like FP16 uh, here, 46 here, FP30, 46. Normal is 301, et cetera, et cetera. And this is in megapixels per second. You know, this is in cycles. How many cycles it took to execute that? Uh, regist registries that required to execute this, so on and so forth. So this took 12 registries in order to execute it. That's not bad. That's pretty light uh, for this stuff here. And we're not really using much in the way of textures either. The only thing we're using on this particular one is the actual. Um, well, uh, the environment image actually. That's it. That's the only one we're using. So, you know, <laughs> not too shabby um, as far as that goes. Okay. You can also choose branches here and get more detailed information and break things down to finer detail here. Um, so, that's what branches does and really gives you a lot more information if you need that. Um, and you can also export it. You can also go to the log. You can graph it. Because right now, this is the table method here. If you want to, you can graph this and see what it looks like here. And here we are seeing it for the normal FP16 and FP30 here. And our overall computations on them. Which is nice. And it gives a little pop-up uh, tooltip here. Aside from that, probably my favorite feature of them all is the actual assembly one. View assembly code. So if I click this, Oh, yeah, by the way, you need to analyze them. Oh, yeah, I should mention that. That's why I'm not thinking. Uh, yeah, so after uh, you bring up this interface, it's not just enough. I'm sorry, I analyzed this earlier, and I changed the code, so therefore, yes, it's not going to bring up the assembly, because even though it's compiled, it needs to be analyzed and all this stuff, so it can get current numbers. And here we are with this one. Um, and so here we can see some of the numbers on this one what's happening there. So very cool and gives us some interesting information. Here's some of the graphs on this one, um, so on and so forth. If I go here to my assembly, it literally pops up the assembly code. 
uh, which is at the lowest level you can go, it's at the same level as ones and zeros. So this is, um, you know, pretty efficient. And you see, the first thing you'll notice here, all those comments that I have, check it out. Here's all these comments. See them all? None of them show up in the assembly code. They don't, so it doesn't hurt you at all. They're all gone. They don't matter. They don't show up. And the only thing is left is these assembly commands, you know, like this, you know, multiplying registries together, um, moving registries, these kind of type of operations, um, and so on and so forth. And, you know, and in order to make this actual shader occur and make it work. So that's very cool. And this lets you break down and see just how many commands that a single operation or a single function will actually generate in the assembly. So you can actually see if you're like well, going, well, I don't really know which one's going to be faster between uh, one function or one method versus another, and you can't find it in the documentation. You can always view the assembly after you do an analyze and compiled and saved it and all this stuff for the shader. After you've done all that, then you can come in here, look at the assembly code, and see what you get for your assembly code and see how much actual extra executions it actually affects on you and you can start to check out the performance and see if you know something's bogging more than you thought so this keeps things easy and um, light and lets you know if you're not making the best decisions for having something execute okay so with that said um, that's how you do an analysis on the code, and this is how you get a um, well, the assembly for it. So go ahead and close that out now because I don't need it anymore. Um, but yeah, that's really good uh, information for us, uh, checking out how to optimize the stuff. I thought I'd done it in another video, but I've been informed that I did not, and I must have just. Uh, done it in the classroom and then think about it. So um, <laughs> I'll do that. And so I'll have to remember, make sure it goes into the videos too. Okay, so currently we have this method here for our uh, no reflections. I'm mean, sorry, for our reflections with no texture. And well, if this one's selected, let me do an analyze on that real quick. Because this one's coming up as a uh, only 172 calculations for the megapixels should be low, which is cool. But honestly, this one should be a little lower because we're not even handling a texture. And they're pretty much the same code. Okay, yeah, I about to say, this one should come out pretty close to the same thing. And it does. Cool. Yeah, so 172 on it, too. I was about to say, that's high. Yeah, it's for, uh, for the 301, comparatively speaking. Um, so you know, definitely we've reduced uh, calculations significantly on some of this stuff. All right. So previously on a code, I didn't do a lot of stuff because it's just showing how things work. It's going over explanations on things and just showing you how to make something happen and not really about optimization. You'll, see, you'll notice a lot of these are not uniforms. I didn't put a const in front of them, so they're not uniforms, which is very wasteful. Um, so it makes it very slow, and all the stuff could have been sped up easily just by throwing a const in front of it. You know, there's no reason why you can't. It's not going to change. Um, the value's not going to change per frame. You know, uh, multiple times per frame. It's only going to be. It's going to be the same value throughout the frame for those. So anything's going to be the same value throughout the frame needs to become a uniform because it uses less system resources. This one's not doing that uh, that you saw in the previous video. Another thing that's going to slow this thing down is that you want to do as many operations as you possibly can and get the same look in the vertex shader. Why? Because there's a lot less vertices than there are pixels. And so that makes a big difference too. Uh, so over here, you know, we're normalizing on a per pixel basis, which is very inefficient. And previously I wasn't able to actually normalize it in the vertex shader and then pass it into the pixel shader, although it should work and it didn't and I try it now and now it works <laughs> so after I've had some system updates and it just now works I don't know uh, but it, it now works and so previously this was written on uh, older code where I literally just couldn't get it to pass it just it wouldn't do it uh, for whatever reason and now it wants to do it just fine so I don't know what to say um, 
but I've changed that now. I updated the code over here and over here to where it actually is not being done. And you'll notice how short the code is now for an FS shader here compared to this here. So we're doing a lot less on the pixel per pixel basis, which means it's going to run a lot faster. And that's really important to note. Um, that does make a big difference on that. And I'm, I still am. So this is also, not only is this enhancing your reflection shaders for speed, but this is also enhancing the speed up of the actual pixel shaded uh, speculars for that of the Fong shader, you know, or the Lambert shader. And so you can take the same approach to those shaders and speed them up a lot too. Because the same technique here is going to work for them also. Because essentially, this is a Fong shader with a reflection uh, parameter added in order to make it have this uh, environment reflections on it. So, you know, that's really the only difference. So, we are doing a Fong shader here. And this is how you can optimize a Fong shader or a Lambert shader, or, you know, later on, um, you know, maybe I can take a little bit, not focus on speed totally while making the series and making the very fastest shader I could possibly do it. Really more focused on you learning the techniques and having an understanding of you know the code, what's happening underneath the hood, and having a good solid basis for um, doing this coding so that way you're not in the dark and just like implementing stuff you know, oh I saw that somewhere and I just want to pop it in there and have no understanding of what it does. So that's kind of what the focus here is on the series. Let's move forward now. So I really need to do a full breakdown of this because I've changed a decent amount of code. Um, I talked about some of this here, but I really do need to break it down and go over what I've done. Okay. So um, this is a vertex reflection shader here with a Fong light model, and it's been highly optimized towards the. Well, I won't say highly, but it's it's been very optimized. Um, towards the vertex side. Who knows? Someone probably somewhere may know some trick to make it run faster. Who knows? But um, I think I would put halves. Uh, I, I know of something off the top of my head I think it could make it run a little faster off the top of my uh, as far as that goes. If you can use half variables instead of floats in places, um, that would make it run faster. So, you know, wherever you tweak it in. I just didn't feel like um, trying to find out exactly where I could throw in the halves, where it wouldn't cause a problem with uh, FX Composer 2.5 for this particular shader for implementing in a particular place. So, <clears throat> my laziness. But if I really played with this, I could get it. There's, there's definitely places where FX Composer wants it to be a float and does not want it to be a half, even though uh, technically should be able to do a half for certain things like color and things like that. Because as long as it doesn't go beyond the 1.0, or I mean, basically, well, to be safe, the 1.0. Um, range 0 to 10 then you're fine which is what it is for most color unless you're doing overly blown values such as HDRI lighting or such so you know for the most part it should make a difference and a lot of people are um, developers are hardcore about going to 0 to 1 even when dealing with HDRR and it's, the values should never, never go above uh, 10 so you know depends on your school of thought on that but uh, there's a number of people who really feel like that should never go above that we get above the one L as far as that goes. All right, so we got our standard old projection uh, view view world matrices. This stuff has not changed at all. So if you take your uh, reflection shader and copy and paste it in here, you know we can uh, just really rework it a good bit. And so you'll have to do a decent amount of work on it. But I can't help myself. I really want these. I got the good comments in here. <laughs> Somehow I gotta have the good comments everywhere. Uh, can't help myself. All right. Just don't even like some of this stuff anymore. For the other commenting, yeah, let's get rid of those tweakable parameters. I don't like that. All right. Um, you know, let me just copy and paste this across real quick. So you know you're just going to go into of course you should be very familiar with this by now but create effect here and then you're going to you know come in here say check the CG effects come in here select empty and give it a name so you can say form reflection uh, you know VS 
here, no texture, or, or something like that if you want. Uh, and then here when you say with texture when you do this one, probably be a better naming than what I did. I, I just kind of slapped it in there and, and then we'll go, oh yeah, <laughs> I should have named it a little better than what I did. You didn't really think ahead when I was naming it. So, of course, I could always go back and rename it. So, it's not a end of the world type thing where I can actually, you know, go back and take care of that, but um, I just really wasn't uh, planning it out. Started kind of popping in there, playing with it, and then ended up getting something I really liked, and then uh, went on from there. If you do that, that's fine, but should be sure to remember to go back at some point and rename your shaders uh, so that way you don't have you know your shaders um, not uh, doing this stuff so I'm just going to paste this in like that alright cool great now I got great comments on this one too awesome Sorry, I'm perfectionist. Okay, so lamp position. Now, this is different uh, for our point positions here, for our point lights, anyways. Um, so if you put a const in front of it, remember again, it's not going to change per frame. So here on this code, you need to put a const in front of your float three for your lamp zero position here, because otherwise, let's face it, this becomes a varying variable, and that's a waste. There's no reason this should be a varying uh, variable because it's not going to change per vertex it's not going to change per pixel so it just needs to be a uniform in order to make it a uniform throw the constant from it so this is a major optimization remember each varying variable is quite expensive for a shader whereas a uniform variable on the other hand is pretty inexpensive so you know by changing that out you can make it a massive speed up and don't forget that all the different cards they can handle a lot more uniform variables than they can handle varying variables so quite literally what we can have is it can affect whether or not you can run on an older profile or not uh, for instance this one's profile is running on a VP30 and an FP30 in it we got this kind of reflections happening I gotta show this we have this kind of reflections happening on vertex reflections shading happening in real time on an FP30 that's what it looks like on an FP30 and a VP30 that's not bad you know because at these levels they can't even handle you know proper floating point or whatnot on a VP30 and a FP30 I can't of course go to a 20, a 20 is just ridiculous there's no way I'm getting away with that you know I mean that's just there's no way to bam of course not can't do squat with a 20 but the fact that we can do this on a 30 is pretty daggone good um, and that's important. So, and also, not to mention, it's been optimized to run faster on that 30. So, you, you know, because uh, don't forget, you have to run other things <laughs> on the graphics card and not just one little, you know, particular shader here. You have to run multiple shaders with multiple objects in a scene in an environment. And so that really does tax it down. You have to keep that in, you know, perspective and, you know, keep that in your head when you're doing this stuff because if you don't, then it's going to cost you. Okay, so. Let's have a look at it. So, also the color is not going to change over on the light per pixel per vertex. So again, put a constant in front of it, make this a uniform, and that will speed it up quite a bit. And then here I keep always forgetting to put the constant from my ambient light, put it in front of the ambient light. Again, it's not going to change over the execution of the program. So by all means, please do that because it'll make it run faster. Now before we had our KA, KD, KS and our spec power, spec power. and so um, they all already had cons in front of them or should have I believe um, but here's, an, uh, here's another attribute here that needs to have a constant from it and that's this KR here. Remember KR is our reflection. I do not like having that there like that. KR is a reflection and it needs to have a constant in front of it and in doing so this again is can be a uniform because remember your reflection value for the reflection strength is not going to change per frame uh, multiple times per frame it's going to be the same throughout the frame so again this is another great candidate for what a uniform so again this is going to speed up our shader a lot by doing that so put a constant in front of it it's pretty straightforward pretty easy but it's something you need to do of course textures do 
have pixel, uh, you know, we can sample from the pixels and everything per, as far as that goes. So you can't put cost in front of these. They're not uniforms. The struct here, here's our struct variables here. So we have different UVs, different normals, and different positions for every point on, on a pixel on the surface. You know, again, so that stuff's not going to change. Also, light vectors, normals, all this stuff's going to be varying uh, per pixel per vertex. So again, you can't change it. You can't mess with it. Uh, so all these need to be varying variables. It cannot be uniforms. Um, same thing goes for this color here. Again, the only thing you could do to make it faster is be able to replace some of this with halves. And do like a, you know, instead of doing a float 3 like this, if you're allowed to get away with it, well, I wouldn't do it on that one. Um, uh, gee, uh, well, color. Well, it wants to be, yeah, so this is where you get tricky on some of this stuff. Because um, if the values start going, none of the stuff I could do, I don't think I could really do a, f a half on these. Maybe, but I'd be pushing it. Um, colors, sure, like these right here, I would love to, but it wouldn't let me. <laughs> I tried. Um, but the colors, yeah, definitely, anything like color wise, you could definitely do a half on it. Okay, doesn't need to be a float. But these are actual, you know, they have magnitude for the links before they get normalized, so. You don't make it where they can actually hold the number before it's normalized, and you may not get the proper proportions on it, and therefore your vector would be off. It would no longer be accurate, <laughs> and your your shader is just going to go down the tubes. Then it's just forget it. It's going to be toast. It's going to give you completely incorrect results. So all the stuff's the same here, and this stuff here. For the most part, I don't think we have anything in really in a change on this. Now I did change the names here, and the reason I did that is because I wanted to reflect my setup now. So this is in world coordinates, and it's been normalized for the, our light vector here. Same thing for our normal vector, world coordinates normalized it gets converted. Our view vector gets converted into world coordinates, and it's been it's going to be normalized. A reflection vector, far as um, not from the camera but from the light and this is for fog reflection as far as that goes it's going to be uh, in world's coordinate space and normalized and this is our actual reflection coming from our view here uh, you know if you wanted to say like RV for reflection view or something like that that's totally cool I ended up typing out reflection altogether um, but yeah this one's actually coming from the view and this is what's actually making these awesome reflections on our model here so you know, when you're looking at this model, you know, you're actually seeing these beautiful reflections on the surface is coming from this reflection one here. Whereas opposed to this reflection is getting your specular highlights and stuff like that for the balanced light coming off of there, or your half angle if you want to look at it that way. Um, and of course, it's just a float four for the color. Nothing new there. All right, so let's go on down to our vertex shader here, VS out, main VS. Open parentheses VS in space IN. Uh, open curly brace. VS out, out, semicolon, float 4 here, PO equals uh, float 4 here, open parentheses IN dot position dot XYZ, comma 1, close parentheses, semicolon. So this is nothing new. Same old, same old. And then we're going to calculate this as a position in world space. So we're going to multiply our world matrix times our PO, our object uh, space here, position. Um, and then we'll get back a float 3 position in world space. All right, so from here, I went ahead and just started creating our normals here. They've been normalized and multiplied by the uh, world inverse transpose. And remember, this allows for uh, world inverse transpose coordinates. Uh, for non-uniform scaling, which is not possible if you use uh, world coordinate space. So it's a pretty cool solution. Um, I agree on that one. It definitely is. Um, so this lets us you know, non-uniformly scale. So essentially, if I didn't do my world view transform matrix, and I went in here to manipulate this model, Um, as soon as I remember how to, there we go. So let's say I come out here and I want to non-uniformly scale her. 
I can do that. Why can I do that? And it still looks correct on the surface. So you notice my shader didn't get screwed up even though the model now looks funny. Um, I non-uniformly scaled it, meaning I didn't scale it in all three axes equally. As a matter of fact, it's only been scaled in a single axis in what would be considered uh, a non-uniform scaling. If this was just done with world um, matrix and not done with the actual uh, world inverse transpose matrix, um, then this effect would be destroyed. Your calculations for your values would no longer hold true. Uh, but if you do this as an inverse world uh, transpose matrix, they do hold true. And so it does work. And so you end up with, um, well, great results. If I do in.normal here, so if I do my normal multiplied by my uh, worldview transpose matrix, then um, I'll get my normal in world space. So this gets my normal into world space, and then I'm going to normalize that normal. Uh, and so I now have my normal normalized in world space. So I just get this direction, none of the magnitude, and it's in the world space coordinate system. So that's what we want. So we're going to do that pretty much with all these different ones where we uh, get our end result. Remember, this is our position in world space. So if we subtract the lamp's position that's in world space from our point on our model in world space, then we get back the world space um, vector here to the light, but it has magnitude, right? Because it's going to have the, the distance between the two, the difference between the two. We don't want that. We want purely just the direction to our light. So now that we have our, our light direction and magnitude, we need to get rid of the magnitude, end up with just a 1-0 for our magnitude, and get nothing more than direction. So we're going to normalize that. So this gets us our light direction vector in world space coordinates that's totally normalized. All right. So same thing for the view inverse transpose as the world inverse transpose. So we need to also do that too. So we're going to come in here, so we're going to do a view, and we're doing an inverse transpose, and we're not just doing a regular view, we're doing a view inverse transpose. And again, this is to maintain uh, if you do a non-uniform scaling so it doesn't screw it up. So again, we're just grabbing our TX, TY, and TZ. I've gone over this so many times, so I'm not going over it again. Go back to several previous videos. I think I've gone over it like four or five times now. So it's been explained in several previous videos, and there's no need for me to explain it again. Uh, but anyways, this is going to give it to you in um, world coordinate space uh, for our point here. And we're subtracting our, our translate, which is in world coordinate space, from our pos point position, world uh, uh, coordinate space for our point, the position of our point in world, uh, world space coordinate system. Now, when we do the subtraction of our view, uh, actual position, which is what our transpose, um, not our transpose, I'm sorry, our translate of our uh, transform. Transpose is a matrix operation, I'm sorry. Um, but once I uh, subtract those, then I'm going to get the magnitude and the direction. I don't want the magnitude here in the view. I want a vector that points back to the view uh, with none of the magnitude. So of course I need to normalize it. So I'm going to normalize that one too. And once I normalize it, I have the view vector in world space coordinates that's been normalized. So I have just nothing but the direction to the view vector. Awesome, and that's for that vertice. Out dot uh, reflection here, and we're going to get it into a world space coordinate, and it's going to be normalized. Because again, we want just the direction of the reflection vector coming from the light. Again, this is coming from the light. So out dot VWN plus what? So this is our view world, uh, our view in world coordinate vector space, sorry, world coordinate space vector that's been normalized. So we have just the direction plus our light that's in world space coordinate system that's been normalized for its direction vector. We add them together. Of course, well, if you add magnitudes of 1O and 1O together, you get 2O. So again, it has to be normalized again. So after we add these two vectors, we normalize it. And this gives us our reflection vector coming from our light. Um, and world space coordinates has been normalized. OK, let's do a reflection vector that's actually going to do the calculation. And we're doing our calculating our reflection values here per vertex and not per pixel. Now, I want to show you something. 
This is pretty daggone cool. I have to say so myself. All right, so this one here is our uh, expensive one. And these are our cheaper ones here. So let me show you the more expensive one here. All right. And that's only because, you know, your shadows are different, your ambient here is different, blah, blah, blah. But, literally, look at your reflections. Can you tell the difference? I, I looked at it and looked at it, and I can't even hardly tell the difference. It's not even discernible. It's, it just looks the same. And it's so much faster than the other one. So if you look at the values here on this one, it's uh, turned up higher on the ambient color here. So if I turned it down big time too, it would darken it out also. See? So if I went back real quick, I think that just about matches this up between the two. I'd have to double check. Yeah, pretty close. Uh, maybe a little darker in a few places, but for the most part, you get pretty much the same result. It's not something to fret over. It's not something you're going to go, oh, well, I can tell a big difference. You can't. <laughs> Other than, oh, that one's a little lighter right there, and this one's a little darker. I mean, it's just, ah, uh, good luck, you know. So this is the fast one right here that's cheap. It's just running off the vertices here. So it's really, really good. Of course, I got it bogged down because I'm recording, and got several programs running and uh, <laughs> and the web browser going and yeah so I got all kinds of stuff going on to bog down the computer but so that's not the shader that's bogging it down and also this model is really detailed it's got tremendous amount of polys so yeah that also has a lot to do with it too but anyways the shader itself is very fast and you can see that in the analysis performance where the other one was 301 and this is 172 so that makes a big difference too, as far as that goes. If I do an analysis on this one, which is your more expensive one, or should be anyways. Still competing. See the performance running in the bottom here. Okay, so it says completed. Well, that's odd. <laughs> Funny, I can get one value one moment and get a totally different value another moment. I'm gonna go crazy. All right. Let me run analysis now. Might need to save and compile and all this stuff. This is a totally different result we got just a moment ago. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't know. But this has um, more calls than the pixel shader, so I know it's slower. Uh, so there's no way. No way. That's as fast. Okay. So over here, back over into our shader again, we have a reflection happening here completely in the vertex for running our function. So I have out dot reflection here equals negative reflect open parentheses out dot vwm in I'm sorry in uh, so there's our view vector world normalized uh, comma and then out uh, dot normal vector here, world space coordinate has been normalized. Okay, cool. Out dot position here equals mole open parentheses world view proj and space the position in object space close parentheses semicolon. And this just makes sense again because I mentioned this before because this is a float four and this is a four by four matrix. 
so therefore when you multiply them together you get the right result and I don't have to do anything special for that to happen out dot uv equals n dot uv dot xy of course we're just passing uv's out no big deal they come in they go out semicolon return out okay so what was our vs out in here is going to become the vs in it's going to be our input sorry not a vs in but it'll become our input for our pixel shader so vs out is going to be the input so it's going to be the in and then of course fs out space out semicolon still can be nothing more than the color uh, and nothing else so now you'll notice that our pixel shader here is quite short so float for here lit v equals lit open parentheses dot and then open parentheses in dot lwn comma in dot nwn so we're going to do we're going to dot our light vector that's been world nor uh, it's in world space coordinates now and it's been normalized and this is being done on per vec uh, ver per vertex um, for that as far as that goes and that's fine that's perfectly fine but we're calculating our specular on our pixel shaded side so we get the speed of the vertexes for actually getting our light vector which is all that matters anyways because it's going to be done on pretty much the same result for us that goes anyhow uh, for our um, our light and our normals however getting specular per pixel for this for a gradient is makes a difference so by all means do that uh, dot here open parentheses in dot rwn comma in dot um, nwn so this is our reflection vector coming from our light world coordinate space normalized it's being dotted with sorry uh, with our normal that's in world space coordinates that's normalized okay and then we're going to do it to the specular power so this sets up our fong specular being computed on pixel shaded side and not in our vector in our vertex shader okay ambient you'll have to play with this you know you may not be able to see the speculars all that clearly um, on a uh, with the reflection going it'll something be something you'll have to play with and test and try out so you know you might end up with a acceptable result just off the vert vertices alone with that and although I didn't like it without it so <laughs> previously on the other shader I haven't tried it yet so I'd have to ch test it out to see what I get but uh, yeah I haven't played enough I guess but uh, yeah, I like this result so I just kinda went for this one because I, I like the specular power I get um, from the pixel shaded version of it for Fong. Uh, float 3 here ambient equals lit v dot x times ka dot rgb times global ambient dot rgb semicolon so this is going to compute our ambient and again this is for doing our uh, fong shader here and we're going to do this per pixel and there are fuse here per pixel including the lamp color so that's no surprise there either and then also our specular value here too and that's our fong also okay so then we take our reflect color here we do our kr times our text cube here open parentheses environment sampler comma in dot reflection dot xyz here close parentheses dot rgb semicolon so this is going to get us um, our reflections uh, per pixel for our final uh, being uh, done with our text cube here, our texture cube. So of course we have to do this because we have to have the environment cube here to do the reflections and you cannot do that in a vertex shader. So you have to do that in a pixel shader, period. So it's just the same thing as when you're doing like the Fong shader and you want to add a texture to the diffuse channel of the surface. Obviously you have to do that in the pixel shader. It's not possible to do that in a vertex shader. We're doing the same thing here. So we're just loading the texture here into the actual pixel shader that we're actually going to be doing the calculations to get our reflection for the color values onto the surface. Out.color equals float4 here, open parentheses, specular plus open parentheses kd.rgb times open parentheses diffuse plus ambient plus reflect color close parentheses comma 1.0f close parentheses semicolon return out semicolon close curly braces. And there we go. And so this gives us our final result here. Very cool. Come down to techniques. 
uh, you know, and this isn't really anything different from before. It's just as uh, far as the pixel shader stuff goes, we just don't have um, some of those other attributes being calculated here on a per uh, pixel basis. We're doing it per vertex. So technique, technique zero, pass P zero, whatever, same as always. Def test enabled true, def mask true, cold face enable equals false, blend enable equals false, def function is L equal, um, and then vertex program compile VP30 space main VS open close parentheses semicolon fragment program equals compile FP30 main PS open close parentheses semicolon. This should be the same as before. Um, if you're having taken this from the other shaders, all you have to do is change the 40 into a 30 and you're good to go. As far as the other part goes, it's identical. Okay, with that said and done, don't forget to save and compile, but bam, there we are. Um, all right. So if I come over here to my Fong uh, reflection shader here, vertex with texture, um, you know, and let's have a look at that real quick. It's no texture. This is the one with texture here. There we are. So now she's green with MB. All right, so from that, you just kind of come up here to create effect here, then you turn down to CGFX, say next here, go to empty, and then give it a name like Fong Reflect VS with no texture or something like that. Um, I'm sorry, with texture, like so Fong VS, uh, Fong Reflect VS underscore texture if you like, that's fine. Uh, that would work too. Let's just give it a good name. Copy and paste your shader here into this one here. Okay, we don't have much to do now. Uh, that took care of most of it right there, actually. Um, so the only thing we really have to do here is add the actual texture. Because the rest of this is all going to be the same. Okay, so if I come down here, you'll notice we got all the same attributes, all in the same places. We now have this color texture, though. We need to put this back in. And if you don't feel like you know, typing this out, feel free to copy and paste this from another shader. Like, oh, I don't know. Um, we've had several here of textures. Just grab any of them. I don't. Doesn't matter which one. Uh, it is really. Uh, yeah. So this one will work here. Oh, you don't have that one. Sorry. I made that one earlier. I made a bunch of shaders, a whole bunch of shaders. We'll we'll cover them later. Just you don't have these yet. Um, okay, yeah. So this one right here, Fong reflection material. I believe we went over this one. Uh, this is one of the ones we did in the last video. So if you went in here, grab the ones, the textures from here. Yep, it is. Um, so you went in here and just like copy and paste these textures out of here. So you, you did this one in my previous video. Copy and paste these out of here and you can come back over to your uh, other shader here, you know, Fong Reflect VS with uh, texture, with the texture here, and then, you know, paste it in here like that. Bam, there you go. Um, and I'll give you your default DDS. And it's the exact same setup as before. So texture here, color texture, same default color, DDS, diffuse texture, 2D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for our resource types and all this. Um, and then we're going to do our sampler 2D color sampler equals sampler state. And it's the same as always. Color texture here, min filter here, linear, mip map, linear, semicolon, mag filter equals linear, semicolon, wrap s equals a repeat semicolon, wrap t equals repeat semicolon, close curly brace semicolon, so on and so forth. Okay. And then there's only a little bit of a change here. And we still have our UVs going in and out because we were doing the environment texture before. So, you know, nothing new there. We needed that for a reflect period. Um, so we still have that same thing going on here. So yeah, we have the UVs here, uh, and that's text chord zero for that. And 
don't think that's a difference between the previous one and this one. Let's double check that. Yeah, it's identical. So this doesn't change. That's what I thought. So it's identical too for this one here. And then in here the rest is identical. So this is identical here for your VS. It's not going to be any different. Um, and then the only thing left here is really over in the pixel shader. You have this line right here where we add our diffuse texture into the mix, right? So float 3 here, diffuse color equals text 2D, open parentheses, color sampler, comma, in dot uv, close parentheses, dot rgb, semicolon. So again, we're just taking our te color texture, grabbing the individual pixels because we're calculating this on a per pixel basis. And we're saying, where do we need to place them on our model for UVs? Where should they be viewed? Okay, and that's what we're doing there. And then uh, down here, this is all the same. This doesn't change either. Uh, we add back in our diffuse color here times a KD because that was taken out in the previous shader. So if you look at that in the previous shader, you'll notice that it is gone. It's gone from there because it wasn't needed. It was a superfluous um, execution. That's another thing I took out, by the way. That variable wasn't needed. So I just took it out and it's multiplication. And it's just one more mathematical operation that didn't need to be done. So I just removed it. So I optimized that too. Out that color um, here, float four here, specular plus open parentheses, diffuse color times KD dot RGB times open parentheses diffuse plus ambient close parentheses plus reflect color close parentheses comma 1.0 F close parentheses semicolon and be a return out and there we go and that sets us up with our texture here which is very cool and yeah we can come in here and turn down our ambient color here if we like make it darker come into our diffuse if we want darken it up to and so on and so forth no big deal um, same thing goes for our other one I'm just playing now I go back here to my node texture one this one was kinda of bright but remember if I take my uh, diffuse down on this is going to darken it down a lot. So, boom, there you go. And now you have dark chrome. If you like that look more, you know, it's just whatever. You know, maybe that's more desirable. So this really lets you tweak it, you know. And of course if I increase my reflect strength in doing so, it's gonna brighten up. So you know, oftentimes they say, you know, bring it down real dark on your shader if you're wanting to do a mirror, and then turn your reflections all the way up for your strength. Why does that work? Well the reason why that works is because uh, a mirror is a perfect black body, so meaning its color is black it is solid black um, well not as much as like outer space but daggone near it you know it's really really black and you're just seeing reflected light coming back in almost totality so your uh, end result is going to be this look here and so you end up getting this um, well you end up getting a mirror where you just end up seeing everything so you're like going, well no mirrors can be pretty bright yes yeah, because it's reflecting light it's not actually um, the actual mirror itself is black so as far as the color goes um, so that's why when I pull down the color on it and you'll notice here something what, what if it isn't black what happens guys it gets way overblown right so no no shiny mirrors and chrome type surfaces stuff like that are daggone near black I say near black you know so it can vary in here Whereas chrome isn't going to be as black as a mirror is. So here's your mirror, right? And chrome's going to be a little lighter typically. So, you know, maybe something like that there for chrome. And then, you know, your um, 
And you, know, you can always kick up your specular real high for Chrome. I like to, anyways. Um, and then other things you can do for it. For Chrome is typically not going to be totally reflective like this, and so you can then turn down, you know, some of the reflection out of this bit here. So maybe you make it like 70 or 80 percent reflective, and you go into here to your diffuse color and turn it up to get the look you want. So somewhere in there, you know, you know, maybe that's your chrome metal. So it makes a difference for your end result here. Uh, that's something for the artist to play with and whatnot, and not really for something you have to worry about, but uh, be aware of that though. Um, if you're doing like pure reflective metal, like a mirror or something of that nature, it is almost totally black. You could also go very black with the chrome if you want. There's lots of different variations in chrome. So chrome can be, you know, closer to the black area for, as far as its diffuse color, and that wouldn't be a big deal. Um, if you want to, you could always set up presets for the artist because they have no idea about this stuff because they don't, you know, they don't study physics and the mathematics and all this stuff. So they're just looking for fancy hot little buttons they can press to get the look they're going for right away um, as quickly as possible to meet their deadlines and their, you know, get things under budget and that such, uh, all that. So that's what's important for them. Same thing you can do to help them out is, you know, a good idea. But basically, this goes over how to do the reflection shaders from a vertex standpoint versus that of the pixel shaders. Um, this is more efficient. You get really good results with this. Looks really nice in my opinion. And um, I don't know. Ended up being pretty good. And I had fun doing them. And I hope you did too. Well, my name is Nate Nessler, and this is for Hyperactive Studios. And uh, thank you very much.